There is a wealth of information that we can interpret from sedimentary rocks. The reason for this is they hold information about the environment that they formed in. So first we're going to start with clastic rocks, looking at what does grain size tell us. When we look at the grain sizes present within a rock, we can determine sort of the distance from the source that that rock was made. Because larger grains are typically deposited nearer the source, the mountain that's being broken up in most cases, while smaller grains are able to be carried farther away from the source rock. So when we look at a rock that has very large grains within it, big gravels all throughout it, your first thought should be this rock was deposited near the source, near the mountain. Could be by a glacier uh, because they happen to flow down the mountains. When we look at a rock with smaller grain size, here we're down into the sand range, it's been carried farther away from the mountain. It could be in a desert, it could be at the beach, but again a distance greater than what we're looking at for the large gravel containing rock. And when we look at a rock with just mud size grains, again silt and clay, we're looking at uh, a transportation distance greater than either of the two larger sizes that was present in the previous rocks. The second property in clastic rocks that can give us information about the environment the rock formed in is sorting. And again, sorting is looking at the distribution of sizes of the grains within the rock. And we can identify the agent of transportation that carried the sediment by looking at sorting. Well-sorted rocks tend to be uh, carried by wind and water, whereas poorly sorted rocks, the material was carried by ice and gravity. When we look at a poorly sorted rock, and we think about ice and gravity, they don't care what size the sediment is that they're carrying. Could be extremely large, could be extremely small, Gravity is going to bring everything down the hill. Ice is going to freeze everything to the base and carry it together until it drops all of it as one sort of massive piece. Whereas when we look at wind and water, uh, think, have you ever seen wind create a boulder storm? The answer is no. Boulders are too large for wind to pick up and carry. So wind and water will pick up the smaller sediment and carry it away from the larger gravel-sized pieces. That process of separating the gravels from the smaller pieces is our sorting that ultimately leads to a well-sorted rock, again coming from wind and water. The last clastic rock property that we can garner information about the environment the rock formed in is the roundness of the individual grains making up the rock. The farther the sediment has been carried or transported from the source, again from the mountain typically, the more rounded it becomes. The reason for this is if we are very near the source and gravity has acted to pull the material down the mountain, the individual clasts or grains have not hit against each other much. Therefore, when they first break, they're very sharp, they're very jagged, and because they haven't struck each other, as much as a rock, say, that has sediment carried a longer distance, they retain that very angular shape. As the sediment is moved a greater distance, the grains are grinding and striking against each other, and what that does is it breaks off that sharp edge, and it starts to smooth over and round that sharpness. So the greater the distance traveled, the more rounded our grains will likely be that make up our clastic sedimentary rock. For chemical sedimentary rocks, which is our second type of sedimentary rock, we can look at the mineral composition to determine something about how that rock formed. When we have calcite in the rock, we're often looking at a change in chemistry leading to that calcite precipitating or growing out of the water. This could be CO2 degassing. CO2 creates a an acidic condition in the water. When the CO2 degasses or is removed from the water, uh, it becomes less acidic, which is a better condition for calcite to grow. Or we're looking at situations where we have oversaturation. Too much calcite's been dissolved into the water, so it is going to uh, deposit. And when we look at 
the rocks that contain calcite, again, the very special property that the other rocks will not do, that do not contain calcite, is that reaction with acid where we get the fizzing or effervescence. The second chemical rock uh, distinguishing characteristic is looking at a chemical reaction that occurred with the rock. And here we're looking at ion replacement. So what does that mean? When we look at ion replacement, we're looking at a certain chemistry of the mineral. Say we have calcite. Calcite contains calcium, carbon, and three oxygen atoms. When we have water flowing through limestone, which contains the mineral calcite, that water in some places has magnesium in it. And what happens is the magnesium really wants to go into the mineral. So it has a reaction with the mineral or the rock. The calcium atom is pulled out of the calcite in some instances, and the magnesium from the water goes in to the mineral in place of that calcium. That's the ion exchange that we're talking about, pulling out the calcium, putting in the magnesium. That changes the mineral from calcite to dolomite, changes the rock from limestone to dolostone, and changes the properties from reacting vigorously with acid to needing to be powdered in order to react with the acid. The next chemical rock bit of information we can glean is looking at water evaporation. As water leaves and becomes less present, mineral, minerals will begin to precipitate from that evaporating pool of water. The two most common minerals we get when water evaporates are halite, which here we have in this rock, and again, special property, tastes salty. <coughs> Excuse me, and the other one is gypsum, which again, you can scratch with your fingernail to make a powder. Both gypsum and halite are called evaporite minerals because they often form when water evaporates away, which changes the concentration of them in the water remaining until those crystals begin to precipitate and grow. <clears throat> Excuse me, the last bit of information that we will gather from chemical rocks is looking at material that got dissolved in the water and then recrystallizes. So when we look at the chemical rock chert, it's kind of weird because there are examples of chert that have fossils in them. And when you see a fossil, your thought automatically should be biochemical. So why can chert contain fossils, but then also be considered chemical? The reason is, this rock started out as plankton floating at the surface of the ocean. Those plankton made silica shells, or essentially quartz uh, containing shells. Those plankton, when they die, sink to the bottom of the ocean, begin to pile up on the floor of the ocean. Those silica shells over time dissolve into the water slightly and then recrystallize out of the water. And it's that process of crystallizing back out of the water that leads chert to being a chemical sedimentary rock rather than a biochemical, even though the material started with biochemical or biologic origins, that process of dissolving and recrystallizing at the end makes it a chemical sedimentary rock. The last group of rocks, or type of sedimentary rock, is biochemical. And when we're looking at a biochemical rock, we're almost always, but not 100% of the time, looking at a rock that formed in an environment underwater. Uh, one of the big reasons underwater is we have uh, life present and a submerged environment is often much more uh, prone to preserve the biologic material, which is what we need in order to have the biological uh, sedimentary rock in the end. So even if we're looking at microscopic fossils, starting as plankton in the ocean, falling to the bottom, those fossils are preserved. If we looked under a high-powered microscope, we'd be able to see the shells of those organisms. If we look at coal, that's made up of plant debris. Yes, that plant was growing above the water surface, but when the leaves started to drop into the water, they went to the bottom. Very low oxygen environment helped in that water, helped to preserve the plant matter that was then altered into the coal that we're holding. Or we look at something like a coral reef that has lots of life, 
as those organisms die, the hard parts, typically the shells uh, and the branches of the coral, are then preserved in the fine, soft mud that surrounds them, uh, again, underwater for the biochemical. So looking at clastic, chemical, and biochemical rocks, we are able to get a vast amount of information about what the conditions at the surface of the earth were like at our location going into the remote past. Could be hundreds of millions of years into the past. We're looking at rocks that are telling us, even though we're above the surface of the ocean today, in Illinois, we're living in a, northern Illinois, we're living in an environment that is dominated by glacial deposits from the last 30,000 years. When we go to bedrock and we're looking what's deep below our feet, we're actually seeing signs that we were once underwater. There were coral reefs. Uh, we were in a tropical setting. This is going back, you know, a billion years, uh, actually south of the equator. So all of that information is held in sedimentary rocks, and hopefully this video serves as a good starting point to help you decipher that information.